my channel. In today's video, we're going to talk about the fact that we are created to worship, but our worship has to be more than about ritual. It's about relationship. Let's go. Hey everybody, it's that Sunday School Girl of thatsundayschoolgirl.com. Welcome to the lesson for Sunday, April 22nd. Well, it's Sunday night for me, and I hope that you had a wonderful day in worship. And yes, I hope that your worship began today in Sunday school. I know that mine did, and it was absolutely an awesome class. Listen, I am thoroughly convinced. I know we set a lot of expectations for our teachers, and the bar is raised high, but I am thoroughly convinced that the cadence or the temperament of the class is set by the students. And in our class this morning, it was very clear that students read the lesson and came prepared to be a part of the dialogue. So it really brought a different energy and to hear the different thoughts and the way that each of us processed the lesson was just so great. And to, again, take those learnings and massage them inside of what you studied and go out with something different. It is really great. And besides what, Sunday morning worship begins where? in Sunday school. So I hope that something wonderful happened in your classes and you will carry that with you for the rest of the week. If you're new around here, welcome. You have just joined the largest cyber community of Sunday school students on the World Wide Web. I say it all the time. I don't know how we connected, but I'm glad that you're here. And so since you're here, do me a favor. First of all, everyone do this for me. Make sure that you have hit the subscribe button. Not a week goes by that I don't get an email or an inbox that says, did you post the lesson yet? Yes, but you know that when you have hit the subscribe button. So is it here or is it here? I never know that. But do that and make sure that you hit the notifications bell. That will give you an email immediately when content is uploaded on this channel. So I'll share very quickly personally with you. Uh, today was a busy day because after church, I took my photographs for my graduation announcement. And so this week, praise God, is my last week of class. When I walk out on Thursday of this week, that is the last teaching class of my law school journey. And then I have my two finals. And then you all know what happens on May 12th at one o'clock. So that's my personal update. I'm excited about what God is doing. But more importantly, I know that as my time is redistributed down the road, I'm excited about the space that he's opening up for you and I to be connected and for me to do what he's called me to do. And that's be a greater resource working with each of you to change the way that people see Sunday school. This is a needed ministry and I am convinced that it is still alive and active and adds so much value in our ministry. So again, I am glad that we are connected. Do me one more favor. Make sure that I, I want to be one of your favorite people. So check out www.thatsundayschoolgirl.com. And if I'm not already saved to your favorites, let's change that. Today, I want to be one of your favorites. So make sure that you save it. There's all sorts of training information there. If you are a teacher, a Christian education leader, a superintendent, and you have not checked out 30 Ways in 30 Days, which is inspiration on how to grow your class and grow your Sunday school, you are missing it. But if you click the link, you can get more information in uh, the website. Take a look as well at the TSSG store. There are all sorts of gift items, t-shirts, uh, journals, fun things that express our love for Sunday school. So again, I invite you to check out the website, save me to your favorites, and together we are going to continue to do what we do, making Sunday school the place to be. Listen, that's all I have for now. Let's get into the lesson. Our lesson title is Heavenly Worship. The Bible basis is Revelation chapter 4 verses 1 through 11. The Bible truth. Revelation teaches that God alone is worthy of our praise, wonder, and awe. Our memory verse is verse 11. And the lesson aim is that we will research the significance of the symbolism of the heavenly worship in Revelation. Long for the time when God will be worshiped in eternity and worship and give praise to our awesome, fearsome God. As we get into this week's lesson, I want to remind you that the accompanying notes, my TSSG notes, 
for this lesson are available. If you look in the information box down below, you'll see a link and you can click that link, access the notes, and they are an immediate download once you get into the system. So they are definitely handy to have as we get into the lesson, if you're gonna follow along or maybe even print them and have them with you as you do your personal study for this week. So we are in a new book of study and that's the book of Revelation. And guess what? We're here for two weeks. So buckle your seatbelts. I know that people um, have mixed emotions or thoughts about the book of Revelation. Some people find it very energizing, but there are a number of people who find it kind of scary because there's a lot that goes on and we're looking at end time things and what is to come. And a lot of the imagery is very, um, it's very shocking imagery that we see. I actually enjoy studying Revelation. Now there are elements of, of course that cause us to uh, want to reflect and make sure that we are ready for the second coming of Christ but I enjoy the sensory sight sounds of Revelation as we're reading. And so uh, you'll probably notice in the notes that I have that I've done a lot of marking of kind of things that are moving and happening and there is just so much. But in this week's lesson, it reminded me of, I'm an HGTV junkie. Like when I have time, when I have those down moments, you will catch me just kind of flipping and if I have a few minutes, HGTV is one of my favorite things. And one of my uh, most exciting parts, I guess, like any other show, is when they do the great reveals. I love when uh, new homes have been uh, built or when they've been remodeled. And there was actually a show that wasn't HGTV. I think it was, I don't know, one of the other stations that had like these wedding um, wedding ideas where people were on a certain budget uh, they had a celebrity person who came in with their budget, took their style, and when they came to their own reception, the bride and the groom had the opportunity first to see the reception space, and it was always a great surprise to them. So I like the idea of the grand reveal. What does that have to do with the book of Revelation? When we study Revelation, specifically this week's lesson, chapter 4, it is sort of like being on HGTV. It is a grand reveal to the question that so many people want to know. What is heaven like? And we you know, see these images of angels floating on clouds with their harps. But here we find out what it is that heaven really looks like. And again, we are in the fourth chapter of Revelation. We've been studying the writing of John the last couple of weeks. And this is the same John who is now writing about future times. And our time will not allow us in this video to go back and pick up chapters one through three, but it's definitely worth the background as we look at John on the Isle of Patmos and this experience that he has again that gives us this peek into heaven and John with his limited words as a human uh, with our frailties tries his best to use language that we would understand to describe this awesome scene and the majesty of God and just the wonders of heaven and he's he's looking at the setting a setting that's not earthly and again trying to describe it in ways that we will understand Again, uh, Revelation is a very sensory book, so you'll want to watch for sights and sounds. Now, we are printed text of chapter 4, verse 1, but it's important to take a look at uh, verse 19 from chapter 1. When John is being given instruction and he's told to write things which thou hast seen, things which are, and the things which will come hereafter. So chapter 1 is really about the things that John has seen. That's the vision. Chapters two and three are writing about the things that are. And what is current at that time is the seven churches. And so John has written these letters to the seven churches dealing what's going on in that time in Asia Minor. And in after chapter three, we really don't hear about the church again until the end of Revelation. So chapter four is somewhat of a transition to that third category of here after it, this is not the tribulation, uh, but he's talking about hereafter. So as we look at um, verse one, it says, "After this, I looked. After what? After verses? After chapters one, two, and three? After having written about what he's seen, 
written to the seven churches. This is what comes next. That's that transition we talked about. After this, I looked and behold, there was a door that was open in heaven. And first he hears a voice. This door opens and suddenly it's heaven that he sees and he hears a voice and he describes the voice again as best he can. And it's like a trumpet. Think about the instrument, a trumpet. It's noted because it's a powerful sound. Uh, think about games that you've been to and when the band plays, there's something distinct about the trumpet. It's uh, an intense and brilliant sound. It's very stately. And even though the language in uh, chapter one sounds a lot like First Thessalonians, uh, that would be First Thessalonians chapter four, verses 13 through 18, where it talks about uh, the Lord descending from heaven with the shout and the voice of an archangel. This is not the rapture. I want you to keep that in mind because we're only dealing with John and the rapture. There is a group of people that are caught up, but this is just John. And he hears this very distinct voice, very powerful voice, very stately voice. And it's talking with him. And the voice says to come up. That's the voice of Jesus saying to come up and I'm going to show you the things which must be hereafter. That's that same hereafter from chapter one, verse 19. So John is talking about what comes next. I will show you. In other words, he's given a full guide as to what is going to happen in the future. And it's what must be the King James says. In other words, there's no choice. This is definitely going to happen. And again, the hereafter implies that it is a future time. Verse two says that immediately John was in the spirit. Uh, this happened very, very quickly. And John uh, is now talking about what he sees. This is that HGTV reveal that we talked about. Um, he doesn't actually go to heaven, but he says he was in the spirit. So he has a vision of heaven and specifically God's throne room. Now let's talk about the throne room. He says, behold, there was a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Now the throne, think about it, is um, it's representative of stability and being planted in a seat of power. It's a seat of authority, of control, of sovereign rulership. And in this moment, again, I guess I'm really stuck on HGTV. The throne is the focal point of the room. What is the focal point? It is the center point of interest or activity. So everything that we're going to read about that's going on in this room is happening with its focus being on the throne. When John goes into heaven or has this vision of heaven, the throne is the first place that his eyes go. It's captured his attention and he's explaining now what he sees. Um, he sees this throne. He sees the splendor of the throne. Now, before the church has been the focus in chapters two and three, the church has been the focus, but now it is all about the throne. Chapters two and three, the church has talked about 19 times. We don't hear about them anymore because it's all about the throne. And the throne is mentioned, I believe, 12 times in chapter four alone. And then he talks about the one who sits on the throne. Now, who is the one? That one is God the Father. And we know that because as we continue to read through Revelation, we see the son is mentioned later because it's the lamb who's the only one who's worthy to open the seal. So that lamb is Jesus. So here we have God who is in this place of authority, central rulership, sovereign rulership, control on his throne. And verse three says that God sat on what looked like Jasper and Sardine or Sardine stone. And there was a rainbow around the throne that looked like an emerald. So again, he's sight sensory kind of describing what he sees. It's a very majestic scene. And he talks about it, first of all, in the form of precious stones, the first being Jasper, which is clear like a diamond. And if you've ever shopped for a diamond, you know that you are very interested in the cut of the diamond because that is about how the diamond reflects the light. And then you're very, very concerned about the clarity of the diamond. You don't want it to be yellowed. So the more clarity you have, the uh, higher quality the diamond is. And so he talks about the bright clarity. In other words, this throne, it sparkles. And then the sardine or sardine stone is red colored. It's a beautiful blood red color. Now, interestingly enough, these two stones are actually the first and the last stones 
in the breastplate of the high priests of the tribes of Israel. And I've given you the reference for those on the notes. The first and the last stones, the alpha and the omega stones in their bre bre breastplates. Um, and he also talks about the rainbow that looks like an emerald to so a very deep colored green ring around the throne. So uh, all sorts of colors that we're dealing with now, kind of the sparkle, the red, the green, there's just a lot of color to see and a lot going on. Again, it's best that John can describe it. Around this, he sees 24 other thrones. And on those thrones are 24 elders. So there's a central throne and 24 encircled around it. Who are these elders? Who are these 24? This video will not allow us to exhaust all of the commentary that you will find on this subject as you study. Uh, there's a lot of thought around uh, whether it represents tribes of Israel, uh, Levitical priests, the disciples. Uh, you're going to see a lot out there, but there is no definitive answer. And I decided that it's not overly important to get lost in who they are, but I think this lesson points us more to what they are doing, the function of what they are doing. Remembering our quarterly theme is acknowledging God. And that's exactly what these 24 elders are doing. They are acknowledging God. We learn more about the elders in verse four. Their attire is all white and they have on crowns made of gold. Here was my aha. These elders are before the throne. They're dressed in white, which represents their purity. That means that they have not dirtied themselves or they have been washed from sin. They're obedient, they're overcomers. And notice that only holiness can be in the presence of he who is most holy. Verse five says that out of the throne proceeded lightning and thundering and the voice, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now this lightning and thunder, think back to our lesson, I believe it was last quarter maybe, Exodus chapter 19, when Moses approaches Sinai, we saw the same sensory response with the voice, the lightning, the thunder, uh, the power of God on display. This is actually happening continually as John explains this vision. And notice again that this is about the power of God being displayed. And then the seven lamps burning represent the spirit of God being present. It is the spirit. Verses six through nine then talk about what's in front of the throne. And before the throne, it looks like a, a sea of glass. Basically the floor is, it looks like glass and it's described as a sea of glass. If you've ever been out and looked at the sea, a sea can be very calming. A sea can have a little turbulence, but this is heaven we're talking about here. So I assume that we're talking about a very calm, but a very beautiful floor. God's floor is beautiful. It's crystal. It looks like a sea. Uh, in fact, Isaiah 66 and one says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. And here we see his footstool looks like a sea. And in the middle of the throne, around the throne, there are these four beasts. And one translation says four living creatures and they are full of eyes. They can see everywhere and all around them. So first of all, notice there's a little bit of space in between uh, God and then you've got the flooring and you've got these 24 elders around. So there's some space there, but we have these four living creatures. Remember that God created all things. So he's even Lord of these beasts. They are subject to him as well. And the description that we see of these living creatures very much mirrors uh, what we studied back in Ezekiel chapter one. These four creatures look like a lion, a calf, or some translations say an ox, a man, or an eagle, and an eagle. And I've done some kind of breakouts on what the characteristics of each of those are. But the lion, think about the lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, the fact that lions are generally uh, symbols of strength and courage. Um, and they're celebrated generally because we think of them being strong and courageous and very fierce animals. Uh, the calf or the ox uh, is a servant animal and they're very diligent and dependable um, and they have an honest nature about them. Man being the wisest of God's creations. And then the eagle uh, that doesn't mix with other birds, but flies at a higher altitude. So we see these 
four creatures. These creatures have a distinguishing feature of angels, and that's their six wings. And all they're doing is giving worship to God, glory to God continually. There's never a pause. They're saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Now, that's three things happening in there. The first is the threefold mention of his holiness. The fact that God is perfect in his holiness. There is none like him. That's the holy, holy, holy. Secondly, we see the sovereignty of God, Lord God Almighty. Lastly, the eternity in God, which was and is and is to come. God is the only constant in the entire universe. Then in verse 10, we go back to these 24 elders and we look at the response then of these elders in the presence of God and their response to is eternal worship. So what we see in God's throne room, first of all, is consistent, constant, and eternal worship. That is the dominant activity going on in the throne room. If we want to know what heaven is like, one thing we clearly see is that it is continual worship. And notice these elders do not hold back in the giving of their worship to God. They fall down before him. They worship him. And then they cast their crowns before him. Again, these crowns, uh, Revelation 2 and 10 is, says, be faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of life. These crowns are basically a symbol. They're a reward for their faithfulness. And this highest honor that they basically earn, they are casting before he who is most worthy. Now look at their worship again. The elders are worshiping God for who he is. But to do that, they have to know him. They clearly recognize God and know him for who he is. Secondly, based on what they know about God, they respond to him. And they respond again by falling down before him and casting their crowns. In other words, this worship, first of all, again, takes place in an environment where there is no sin. Think about the scene of purity that we've seen even in these white garments. So this worship takes place in a pure environment where there is no sin. Secondly, we see that their worship involves humility. They're bowing in his presence. And lastly, their worship involves surrender. They're giving up that precious possession. They're giving up the crown that's been given to them that displays or talks about their faithfulness. And finally, verse 11, in random factoid, verse 11 is my favorite scripture. If you ever hear me called on in a meeting or off the cuff and I have to give a scripture, you're always going to hear Revelation 4 and 11. And here they are making, these elders are making declarative statements to God that he's worthy. It is fitting. It is right. It is suitable. It is appropriate. It is our natural response to offer this kind of worship to you. You are worthy to receive glory. Three things, glory, honor, and power. You should dig into each one of those for you, God. Here's the reason. It's a statement. You are worthy of these things, but then we answer the why is he worthy? And he's worthy for two reasons. They substantiate their statement that he is worthy based on two things. Number one, because he's created all things. And secondly, all things were created by his will. They were simply for his own pleasure. And again, they recognize that in the presence of he who is most holy. Here are my key learnings from the week that ends our printed text. But here are my key learnings from this week. We're talking again this quarter about acknowledging God. So how do we bridge? You know, we may not have instinctively thought about revelation and how that connects to our acknowledging God. Well, the first thing that we see in this lesson is that God is active. He didn't just create us or create everything in the world and then leave the world to itself, but he is active. And even when things seem chaotic, uh, he's still seated on his throne. He remains in control. Even in this scene, he always remains on his throne. And on his throne, the Bible tells us that he never sleeps. He doesn't slumber. He's not going on vacation, but he's always present. Not only that, but he has all power. We talked about the sovereignty of God. He has all power. And though he created us in love, 
He sits in his seat of judgment and he sees all and he's evaluating all. And we should keep that in mind. The next thing is that we are created to worship. Here we've seen this continual scene of worship in heaven and we just the same, just as the creatures that we saw and as the elders that we've seen, we are created to worship. But our worship is not just about a ritual. It's not about the fact that it's Sunday morning, but it is about the relationship that we have with God and our relationship causes us. It's the avenue that allows us to know who God is. And that's how we reach the place of true worship. When we know who God is, the more we know about him, the more our relationship is developed with him. And what do we know about God? That he's set apart from his creation. He's holy, holy, holy. Secondly, he is a sovereign God. He doesn't have to consult anyone. He makes all of the decisions. I loved what my grandfather used to say, God, you are the boss, you are in charge. And that's so true. He doesn't have to consult with anyone. And lastly, he is the God who was, is, and is to come. He's the God, even it, he's God even of eternity. Next, we should note that our worship involves purity. The fact that we see these elders in their white garments again represents purity in the presence of he who is holy. And that says to me that we must acknowledge God in all that we do, and we cannot come before God's throne any kind of way. And so before we come to him, we must be washed of sin. We must be pure when we come before his throne. When we come, we must come as those elders did, humbly before God. And then lastly, be willing. Our worship requires that we surrender. We give up something. The elders gave up their crowns. We may not have crowns of gold, but we must be willing to give up Anything that causes us from being open in God's presence, we can't hold back anything in our worship and not just material things, but even our own desires are things that we have to surrender in our worship. And lastly, it is by God's will that we exist. And this is huge for me to be reminded that I am created with purpose, that you are created with purpose that you're not here by accident, that God knew what he was doing when he created you and he's placed you here for purpose. But our greatest purpose is to give God worship. So as we're acknowledging God, that is what I got out of Revelation chapter four. Again, as we are talking this week about heavenly worship, and we're gonna be in chapter five next week. So I'm gonna stop right there. That is the lesson for this week. I cannot wait to hear what you've gotten. Teachers, you should be studying early. There's a lot in here and there's a lot that connects pieces together. So let's keep the conversation open this week. I'll be watching comments. So if you're gaining things in your study this week, share them back with me. I will continue to study as well so that I'll be ready for class next week. Just the same. Listen, that's it. Thank you all so much for sharing the lesson with me. Share this with someone else. I'm asking you to share this video. Most of all, I will see you in Sunday school. Bye, everybody.